Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the QT2 Systems Podcast Series, The Coaches of QT2. Our featured guest for today is Coach Eric Call. Um, so welcome, Eric. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you. Thank you for being for inviting me, and uh, good seeing you again. Just saw you a couple of days ago. So. I know. Eric and I, we only live a two and a half, two hours apart from each other, but not being in Sarasota, I don't get to do all the really fun stuff that that crew gets to do. That's so. right. That's right. So Eric, um, you've been with QT2 Systems for a while. Can you tell us um, how how you came to join and when you came to join QT2? Yep. Yeah. Um, I think I came in somewhere around uh, 2014, uh, both Jack and I, and I think Jack already mentioned that story. We were coaching here locally in Sarasota. Uh, and then uh, when we when we acquired OutRival, um, both Jack and I kind of took that concept that we already had here in Sarasota and applied the same thing uh, through OutRival. And then we gradually worked our way through through the other brands. Um, but I'm pretty sure it was around 2014. Okay. And when you say, um, just so that for people who aren't familiar with what that outrival concept was can you just talk about that a little bit more? oh yeah absolutely so uh from the beginning when jack and i started coaching uh before uh qt2 we we had a lot of groups uh we we actually had camps we had like eight week camp 12 week camps in preparation for races so we quickly acquired a, a the group setting where uh we would have athletes that would meet up every wednesday or every saturday we would do our you know our group rides or our group runs together uh, even we would start and finish together, even though every athlete may have had their own separate workout. Uh, and that's something that that stayed with us. We still have uh, a group that we meet up every Saturday and or Sunday here in Sarasota. Uh, we normally do our group rides on Saturday, uh, transition run after that. And then Sunday is traditionally a long run. And depending on the weather, we'll do an open water swim afterwards. That's nice. Yeah, you guys have, I I'm, I said, well, I only live two hours from you, but it's it's totally different. I mean, really envious of the group dynamic that you have established and continue to, to keep going in Sarasota. Yeah, it, it works out good because uh, coaches and athletes, it, they, we keep ourselves account, uh, accountable. Um, you know, some days it just becomes like, oh, do I really want to do that? And sure enough, the group's coming out and then we all meet and, and we end up having great, great workouts. Uh, a lot of us live probably within five or 10 miles from each other. So uh, we have spontaneous workouts during the week. If, you know, one of my athletes wants to do a tempo run or something during the week, like, hey, I'm going to be running close to you. You want to meet? I'm like, sure, let's let's do that. So it works out good just to keep us accounted and accountable. So of the, the athletes that you train, do most of them live locally for you or do you train people who are also virtual? I am. Um, I would say probably half and half. Um, I do have some local athletes uh, that, that I've coached for years and uh, definitely have my share of athletes that are uh, not local, that, you know, throughout the country. Luck luckily, with, uh, with, with training peaks and the web, I mean, we can do everything virtually. It's just, it's just easy anymore. Yeah. Yeah, it is incredible. I used to um, train a lot of athletes locally. And then when I moved from New York to Florida, I kept probably 10 of them that still work with me. And I feel like in a lot of ways, I know them better now than I did then because of all the data, you know, I mean, there's no, there's no hiding. So it's great to be able to see them in person, but you get so much out of what the interactions that, that you do through training. Teams. Yeah. And I'm glad, yeah, you brought up a good point in by not being so close to them, you can actually pay more attention to their workouts versus getting involved with the workout and not, you know, looking so much at, at how they perform versus I was there. I saw it. Uh, but yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, I feel fortunate that I've had athletes that I've coached for six, seven years continuously in, 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 in being able to see them grow, you know, as an athlete, regardless of what their goals are. Uh, it, it's, it's really cool. And, you, and you're right. Sometimes the Further out, athletes are are easier to to identify the workouts because you're just looking at you know at the data and kind of seeing how they're performing versus oh I was there with you I saw your outfit or whatever it was uh, yeah. you, you get less involved with that yeah yeah because sometimes it's uh 
the data sometimes tells a different story than absolutely <laughs> absolutely and, and it's very true so, yeah and, and then you, and then you're just more objective versus subjective and you're just kind of looking at exactly what the data is saying and sometimes you have to say hey how did this go uh because i'm yeah. seeing one thing and i'm not hearing a comment or something from your side is are these numbers real or or not yeah yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we were talking earlier and all, I mean, QT2 coaches, we all follow the same process, but um, use technology to different degrees. And you tend to be a coach that uses a lot of technology. You just did a webinar on, on training with power. And um, so can you talk a little bit about the technology that you do use and how you um how you incorporate that into your coaching? Yeah, absolutely. I think a, a big part of what we do as coaches is uh, guiding our athletes, or I like to say, I, I like to manage your stress. And that stress comes in the form of life, training, and a couple other things that as coaches, we should be looking at in order to uh, help their bodies adjust to the additional stress that we're gonna be adding to it. So uh, that is pretty important. Um, I'm like you said, I, I love looking at, at numbers, but I think there should be a, a happy medium in between what the data and the numbers are saying and how the athlete is feeling. Um, sometimes uh, you'll get a new athlete that has a disconnect in between their perceived exertion or how hard the workout feels and what the data is saying. Um, and, I, and I have a great friend that we've been friends for 30 years, and he's definitely one of those. I mean, if he's not hurting doing a workout, he doesn't think he worked out at all. And I'm like, Dale, <laughs> it's not, it shouldn't always feel like this. Like, no, it, 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 I feel good now. And I'm like, well, you know, there, there are reasons to train easier some days and, and harder other days. But it all comes down to um, learning your athlete and then utilizing the data that we have access to to training peaks and whatever the forms of uh of data that we're looking at uh and helping the athletes grow as as an athlete and perform better yeah yeah for sure i mean i always say with my athletes i'm like i want to see the data but i don't want to comment on it till you tell me <laughs> something yes. about your workout you know because <laughs> the data it, it says a lot yeah you know in in and when I when I do a new athlete intake, I'm right off the back. I explain to them, this is a relationship here. I, I need to hear something because I can just look at numbers all day long, but they don't they don't paint the full picture. Uh, you know, so the more information that you more feedback you can give me as an athlete in combination with the data, the better we can interpret all of this and then start making projections for where to go from here or how much can you handle. Well, how much more you can handle things like that so yeah that that the daily uh or regularly commenting on workouts is is a pretty big thing that i harp on yeah or, or sometimes i just get to the workouts like and how did this feel <laughs> that's my comment to them because i i need a little feedback because i'm seeing things and i want to make sure that what i'm seeing is is real and not just maybe a technology mishap or something yeah <laughs> yeah, I made that mistake the other day. I had an athlete that he told me what his pace was. I looked at the stuff and then Training Peaks is showing all these records. I'm like, where are those records from? <laughs> because when yeah. you look at the data, they weren't there. It was like Training Peaks had made this stuff up. I don't know where it came from. I had I had something similar uh, two weeks ago at our camp in Claremont. One of my athletes was there and she forgot to bring her stride. And uh, we did a run. We ran together. So I was with her at that time. And I get back to the to my hotel room and I started looking at workouts and all of a sudden I'm getting all this notification that she has a new threshold and I'm like okay well that's cool, and it was literally 150 watts higher than her previous and I'm like something going on here so I I sent her a little message she goes oh I didn't even have my stride with me so Garmin just created this own formula on their own and just created these these power zones without a power meter or the stride so we had to like delete that workout i'm like it's okay it's on training peaks but we have to delete it from the stride ecosystem otherwise it's throwing everything off yeah yeah for sure yeah data is only as good as it i mean sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but it's, it's, yep. it's good to it. have it's it's important so um so just backing up a little bit um 
you said that you work with athletes both locally and virtually. Is there a type of athlete that you like to work with or, you know, from a either experience standpoint, distance standpoint, anything? No, I would say not really. Um, you know, I, I to not to sound cliche, but I love to work with any athlete that's that's willing to do what we're asking them to do in allowing the process to show the outcome. Um, you know, for a lot of times that might be a beginner athlete that's just kind of so green and they don't know better. And they're like, oh, I'll listen to whatever you say, which is great. Um, sometimes they have less uh, bad habits. Um, but no, I mean, I have, you know, I've been fortunate enough to, like I said, to train athletes that I've had for some of them five, six years ongoing, um, several Kona qualifiers or world qualifiers. But I, I love the, the beginner athlete that's just willing to learn and listen because we can bypass a lot of bad habits and just start from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and you tend to see, at least I tend to see uh, benefits or improvements quicker with the, with the newer athlete because there's so much room to grow where sometimes you're working with the higher level, higher performing elite athlete. And we're literally looking for like 1%. I mean, where can we, where can we find that 1% to improve, um, you know, rather be on the swim, on the bike and, and things like that. But when, when we can look at, a, at, a, at an athlete and say, okay, um, your, your goal is this, you know, and, and right now I think we hear, you know, it's not that you can't do it. It's just that it's going to take a little bit longer. And, and then we can look at an annual version of the plan and say, okay, so for the first few months, we're going to try to do this and then focus on this for a few more months. And then hopefully we are, we're, we're tracking in the right direction for whatever, whatever goal it is. It may not be, you know, uh, I don't think every athlete, Abby athlete's goal is to do Kona. Kona, you know, sounds great and all that, but some of them are just like, you know, I want to, I want to be able to do an Ironman. Great, you you haven't done much, so let's start from here. Uh, or I just want to PR, uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's another great goal. That's definitely success. It doesn't mean that they that they they won their age group or they won the race overall. Yeah, but they raced the best race that they could, and they exactly. did better than they exactly. had before. Yeah, well, you know, it's. It's, it's great to have that win or whatever, but you can win and not have a great race too, you know, like yeah. it's, and not feel proud about your race in your own way because you, you're like, oh, I know I didn't put everything into it or whatever. So, yeah. And, and I know we, we were just talking about that. And, and uh, sometimes it's just a, a successful event or a successful build doesn't necessarily mean that you won the race or anything. It's, it might just come down to you executed the best race you could that day. Right. In that success right there. Uh, you know, unfortunately, everybody wants that. Oh, I want to win. I want to do this. I want to do that. But some of the outcome is, is, is out of our control. Sure. You know, we don't know how many other athletes that may be performing better than you show up that day. So you may not get the, the win, but you executed the best race you could and, and you got the best outcome that day. Yeah. Individually. Right. So you're, you also are an athlete, right? I mean, you've raced for years. So how do you take, how do you take that, the athlete hat and put it into your coaching? That's a good question because uh, I, I literally just, just had that race this weekend and I'll share it again. Um, we had a, a local running race and um, for multiple reasons, I did not have the buildup that I wanted to going into this race. I had just finished Ironman Florida in November, and I'm like, okay, my fitness is great. I just got to maintain it. But and then life gets in the way. Uh, a multitude of things happen. I didn't didn't do the the homework that I needed to do to show up for this race. So um, comes race week, I'm like, okay, well, my goal is still here. And I'm looking at my dad and my dad says, well, realistic goal is down here. And I'm like, okay, but how can, how can we, we kind of mission match that? And uh, throughout the day, as, as, as I was running, I was, I was kind of coaching myself saying, well, you know, this is where you need to be at right now and allow yourself to run the first three or four miles at that pace. And if it feels good after that, maybe you can kind of progress yourself. So, um, I think uh, as an athlete, I've, I've 
become really good at pacing myself, uh, staying within my parameters that I understand versus uh, which, which sometimes is good where, where athletes just race blind. They just race without looking at data. They can go out and just do their thing and they may blow up or they may have a perfect race, but they're not too worried about the data where on the other side, I'm like, all right, I'm playing both hands. I, I, I want to push myself, but I, I know what the data is telling me. And I, I better respect that because, uh, you know, like multiple athletes, I've, I've, I've bonked before and I know how bad that feels and how long it takes you to recover both physically and mentally from, from one of those races. Mm -hmm. So then take that when you have an athlete, you know, that's, that's going to race. Let's just use Ironman Florida because I know you've trained quite a few people for that. What do you tell them going into it, you know, in terms of a pacing? strategy or does that depend on the athlete it, it depends on the athlete you know and i'll give you the typical example and i'm assuming you probably have something similar is you you get the athlete six months up you're like all right coach i want to do xyz pace or time for this race i say great write that down but we're not going to talk about it right now um we're going to do the training we're going to do the the, the 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 training blocks that we think we need to do now and a month before the race, we'll start talking about that goal based on the data that we have that we can say, listen, you've done seven bike rides, six hour plus, you're averaging whatever, 200 watts on the bike. It's easy for me to say that that would be acceptable on race day because you're staying within your zones, you know, not taking the weather or any other thing in consideration. So I like to bring the goal back in late in the in the game to say, okay, based on all the data that we have, this is where the a safe race would be. This is where you know whether everything's are in our benefit, and this is your stretch goal. And then we pull that those numbers of that goal that they had and see see where they fit. And but also I tell my athletes that listen, you get to that certain point on the marathon. I don't care if you shut your watch off and just run your heart out, but you have to get to that point because if you, if you take that step early, too early in the race, it's a, it's an awfully long day, you know, hating the race. <laughs> and we've, we've all done it. We like, you know, we wake up and all right, I'm supposed to swim this and you just crush yourself in the swim. And I'm like, Ooh, this is going to make it for a long run or, or whatever it is on the bike. Sometimes just, um, you know, over biking by just 5% will, will have a tremendous effect on, on how your run goes. And marathons are long. I mean, it, it, you know, we're adding 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour to, to an event that's already long just because we took some steps early on that we probably shouldn't have mm -hmm. with, with pacing. So then for the athlete that does that, right? Because... Yep. Who hasn't at some point in their life? Iron Man's a tough day to do that because, yeah, the, the ramifications on the run can be so severe. So, what's your after discussion with someone where you look at that and you're like, yeah, you overpaced that bike by five percent, and this is, you know, correct. And, and that's where that's where the data comes in. You know, I, I'm a lot of times I'll say I need you to trust me now and believe me later. You know, especially throughout the training. Uh, but if something goes wrong um, during the race, you know, that's when we sit down and truly sit down and say, okay, so your goal was to bike 200 watts or whatever, whatever number it is. And we look at your normalized power, your average power, whatever it is, and, and you overdid it. So now there's, there's consequences. So you, we trained your body to, to uh, be used to so much stress and we added extra stress early on in the day. So, so there'll be consequences later on. And, and that's kind of how I look, like to look at it is break it down to, okay, you swim, you know, it is what it is right there. Uh, the bike is where a lot of people tend to make mistake. Um, so if, if they did the right bike and the, the, follow the nutrition that we've been trying and then something didn't work later on in the day, okay, what happened? Uh, but but if they didn't execute that bike properly, we can just go straight down to that and say, look, you, you, we don't have any data that shows that you could bike this hard on the bike and still run well. Uh, so I, I believe that that's really when when the data comes in, that you can sit down with them and, and 
share your screen and say here, whatever, you've done six or eight or 10 hundred plus bike rides averaging from here to here. Somehow on race day, you decided to go this far out. You know, that's kind of kind of how I like to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, I felt really good. I felt really good. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody feels great, you know, right. going into it. Oh, I had a great swim and a great bike. Yeah. And then the run fell apart. Yeah. I think we've all heard that a few times. And, yeah. Nothing I, good ever comes to, out of that. Yeah. Uh, out but, of I felt really good. <laughs> it, it all comes back to the execution. Yeah. It all comes down to that. Yeah. And trusting, trusting the process. Trusting. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Trusting the process. Yeah. So, I mean, over the years with your athletes, doubts, right? They mm -hmm. do their training or not, you know, yeah. and then they get to it's race day and they're stressed about it. What, what do you tell an athlete who has doubts about their ability to be able to perform? You know, um, the, the, I like to do that again early on. Uh, I like to tell my athletes they, they earn their medal doing training. You know, it's not that one workout that makes a difference. It's the discipline and the consistency throughout the entire building block that's going to allow you to have that great race. Uh, whatever great race means or whatever they measure as success, um, it's trusting the process that if they did if, if an athlete can stand at the starting line, knowing that they, they did their best and they completed as many workouts as they could have to, to their best ability, uh, I think it takes a lot of the doubt out. Um, and, and it is scary for some athletes, for example, if they're, if they're from up north and they don't have the ability to do a lot of open water swim and they come down to Ironman, Florida, and it's in the Gulf, or in the call it in the ocean. I'm like, well, it's still water, uh, but they're not used. So if we can take that that one piece of doubt that they have the fitness, um, and then just maybe do a couple open water swims with them, it takes that piece of the doubt out, and then it's just literally putting the pieces together all day long to to match a good outcome. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, so. What would you say as a coach that your biggest coaching challenge is? Oh, that's a good one. Um, you know, as much as we use trust the process is, is, is getting athletes to trust the process. Um, and, and I think that's, that comes right off the back with, with good communication with the athlete um, saying, hey, this is, this is where we at. You know, we, we do, and you know our, our protocols. We do a series of tests. This is where we at right now. This is your baseline. Good, bad, ugly, doesn't matter. This is this is who you are today. I'm proposing we do this for the next three, four, five months, and then uh, with with retesting athletes regularly, we can actually see what's working and what's not working, uh, and we can make adjustments um, throughout the way. Uh, but it, but it's having that open communication with the athlete and explaining why we do some of the workouts the way we do uh, that that helps them trust the process. And again, comes race day, it's just kind of putting all those little pieces that we worked on for six months or eight months or whatever it is, putting them together. Um, but just again, that open open communication and having the expectation in in putting it out there so they know what to expect. So what do you do with the athlete who you give a workout to? So you mm -hmm. give them, all right, you're riding 90 minutes at Z1. And they write back, oh, I felt great today. So I did sprints to the telephone poles. I did. <laughs> what do you say? Yeah, those athletes. No, and, and, and I think there's time for that um, in, in, I think uh, we, we need to work with the athlete in, in allowing them to enjoy the process, mm -hmm. but also educating to the reason why it shouldn't be a, a race every Tuesday night with the group rides. You know, it should be, I need to build the, the durability to be able to ride five hours or whatever it is in Z1. Riding 90 minutes, you know, at threshold or just below threshold is not going to build that in a way. Um, and, and again, and I, you know me and I, I love data. 
So sometimes I'll be like, okay, we'll, we'll take this workout. We're not going to, you know, you, good job. You, you did your workout, but I want you to do this workout next time. And let's look at if your heart rate or your power is going to stay consistent at what we need it to be. And if not, why not? So uh, the beauty of data is that if you understand what you're looking at, you should be able to start spotting where, where things start falling apart. So we, we talked about this at the, at the webinar, if you're looking at decoupling where, you know, the power is staying consistent, but the heart rate is creeping up or, 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 or heart rate stays high, but the power is starting to lower down, you can literally go right back to a specific point and say, okay, your fitness at this effort stops right here. Anything above that, your body's not used to it. So if we, if we are looking at an Ironman athlete, we're talking about a five-hour-plus bike ride for the, for the average athlete. So you need to be able to respect the bike ride and do it that way. Otherwise, you know, your, your run is going to fault. And then, you know, we always want athletes to, to do well and complete their races, but we also need to make sure that they understand what it takes to, to get to it. Sure. Um, and, and enjoy the process. I mean, that's the other thing. They they have to enjoy the process. I used to be very strict at one point. Said, no, no, no. Z1 is Z1. And I don't want you doing anything beyond that. But and then you start to see that, well, even myself, I'll get on Zwift or whatever it is. And I'm biking and, you know, here comes a group. And I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll just challenge myself a little bit more on this hill because there's other people here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, there's got to be a little bit of a, a of give and take that that the athlete can enjoy the process because um especially for longer races like Ironman there, there's a lot of things that you're giving up you may be giving up your extra time watching tv you may be giving up a little bit of the time with your friends uh for this training for this goal so it needs to be an enjoyable process yeah that's for sure I mean there's sometimes like if I see an athlete it's like okay that was a z1 run but then the description is, I know I didn't stay in Z1 run, but I met a friend and I haven't seen them in a while. I'm like, okay. Great. It's exactly. Not, you know, it's it. Okay. Because you don't want the sport to turn you into like an isolation. You know, it's supposed to be fun. That's why we, you know, that's why most of us do it is because it's, it's fun. Right. It so, is. It is. It, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's our, uh, our way to get rid of stress. So if we're asking them to do things that are going to help them get rid of stress, but it's, it's not enjoyable or they don't get to do it the way they want to do it. So sometimes I think we set ourselves up to being too strict and, and then they're not enjoying the process. Yeah. So, but sometimes, and I find the educating them say, Hey, it's okay if you do one workout every once in a while like this, but you can't do every workout like that because you're not going to reach the goal that you want. And, you know, as a coach, my job is to kind of keep those bumpers and kind of guide you through the process where, you know, where you are going to achieve your goals. Yeah, oh, very true. So, um, all right, so we've talked about challenges. Let's flip it around the other way. What would you say is your biggest success as a coach? Hmm. And I think... Uh, you know, yeah, having athletes go to Kona or going to world championship, that's that's success. Uh, but again, not every athlete is ready to do that at this at whatever point in life they are. Um, so a lot of times I think success for my athletes is uh, being able to execute a, a, a great race that day. Uh, it may not be they may not win their age group, but but they did their best, the best of their ability that day uh, in the way I like to look at it, and, and you've heard us all talk about that, it's it's literally, it's having a process uh, goal versus an outcome goal, um, you know, because we, we don't always have control over the outcome, uh, but we have a lot of control over the process. And if the process is right, um, the outcome will follow. So a lot of, again, going back to it, it's just sometimes uh, just having the athlete do uh, the things that they need to do to have a great race and, and that is success for them. Mm -hmm. So are you a, a tracker when your athletes are racing? Do you watch? Um, I, de I definitely am. And I'm a, I'm a big time stressor <laughs> over that because I, I know what I know on my side. I'm like, wait, what's going on here? You know, mm -hmm. is this segment it's a little faster? It's a little slower. What's going on here? So yeah, I'm a big, 
big time tracker and I'll lay down and I'll have, you know, I'll have my computer and I'll have the, uh, the, the tablet and I'll have my phone and I'll have little three devices and I'm like, okay, what's going on here? Uh, and I think that's fun. Um, I think athletes enjoy that. Um, one of the things that I do with my athletes, especially if they're doing a longer race, I'll send them text messages throughout the day, throughout the race, even though I know they don't have their phone, mm -hmm. I'll be like, you had an awesome swim enjoy it you know even though they may not get that message um physically uh, till the end of the day i think that sometimes just putting it out there in the universe mm -hmm. it, it may come to them somehow and they're like wow I, i'm feeling good about my swim or i did a good job on the bike or you know same thing on the run i'll be looking at maybe an athlete just having going through a hard patch on the, on the on the marathon or something i'll be like hey Keep your head together, you know, breathe, follow the process, stick with your heart rate or your pace or whatever it is. And you're going to come out of this soon, you know, and I, so I do, I send text messages literally all day long, just saying, yeah, good job. I'm checking on you and you, and you, and you're kicking butt. Yeah. I do that often. Yeah. Send them out into the universe. <laughs> exactly. I do. I put them in the universe and, and, and somehow it gets delivered. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's great. I mean, I, I have athletes that definitely tell me I heard you in my head. You know? yeah. <laughs> like so. Exactly. And, they you know, sometimes either. they, you know, they not always, uh, well, uh, athletes don't always have somebody on the course that you know, or that you have access to, you can say, Hey, they're doing great. Just let them know X, Y, Z. Um, you know, so sometimes just sending a little, little text message, uh, you know, somehow it gets to them and, and they enjoy it. That's great. So um, that's all the questions I have prepared. Is there anything else that I didn't ask you that you that you want to no, say? I, I, I want to thank you. This was fun, um, you know, casual. I uh, enjoyed it. Uh, but no, I think uh, I think we covered pretty much everything that we yeah. wanted to. So, Well, I have to ask, are you taking any athletes? I, I am. <laughs> I am taking a, you know, I'm, I, 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 like I said, I'm fortunate enough that I, that I carry a, a good amount of athletes, but uh, I, I always like new athletes too, just because it kind of, kind of keeps that, that beginning of the process is, is always fun yes. for, for both of us. Uh, so yes, I'm definitely taking athletes right now. All right. Great. Well, thank you, Eric. Thanks for, for joining and hopefully we'll see you in person again soon, but, the, but right. this was, this thanks. was fun. All right. Thanks, Reem. Have a great day. Appreciate right. it. Uh, okay, bye.